Hi everyone, my name is Dominic Wombacher. I'm a senior partner institutions architect for SUSE at AWS. I help SUSE to bring um, their products to AWS, but also support partners and customers to optimize existing and migrate new workloads to AWS. Um, personally, I would describe me um, as kind of a tech nerd, so I love to um, solve complex problems, contribute to open source, um, and tinker around various technologies. Today, I talk about OpenSUSE ALP prototype on AWS. Um, it's experimental, but I found it fun. Um, during my presentation, I referred to um, ALP as OpenSUSE ALP, but I guess SUSE ALP would be more appropriate, so let's just ignore that. Just say ALP and we'll all be happy. Um, I will start with a few words about ALP in general, then um, how an image for AWS can be built with OBS, then how we get an image from OBS to AWS as AMI, and then about OpenSUSE ALP on AWS when it comes to does it work, how's the experience. Before we start, <laughs> a little disclaimer, my colleagues from AWS are already laughing. Um, yeah, so ALP is an early development state, it's kind of a prototype, um, and things will change. Um, that means the AMI build and the image that I show here and talk about today is unofficial and unsupported. <laughs> um, and it's for testing purposes only. Um, yeah, the motivation behind that, wh why I did that, is, is actually I'm excited about the next generation operating system. Um, I wanted to test it, but unfortunately, SUSE didn't provide an AMI. So I had to build one. Um, Statements I made today um, are based on my personal interpretation and understanding of public available information from SUSE and definitely subject to change. Anyway, <laughs> so um, we heard a lot about ALP and what it is already in the previous talk, and, and I'm quite sure you already was reading a lot about ALP, so I will just um, focus on a small subset set of things, which I personally like most. ALP is a lightweight based operating system. Um, the whole idea, you know, you have your base system, you have your container workloads, um, you have a separation between the host and application layer, and it's an immutable operating system, which simplified means you can't just change something, you know? <laughs> That's like, um, it's not in the early days, you log in, you delete all your files, and you wonder why the system's not working anymore. That's not how it works. Um, also, you have transactional updates. So it means either everything gets applied or nothing gets applied. And I think that, that's really an important thing. Um, yeah, security focus. So that means the attack surface is just lowered. You now, if you have just a base operating system, um, it's immutable. You have SA Linux and, and features like that. Three things that I personally like most when it comes to technical topics um, on ALP um, is the read-only root file system, um, which makes it immutable. That's exactly what, what we mean. Um, but there are some exceptions. For sure, you can just um, can edit configurations. You can um, have application data. But the core operating system is read-only. Um, How is that achieved? by the second part, by ButterFS, um, you have snapshots. So ALP boots into a snapshot, um, and if you change something, you boot into a new snapshot. That's how these things are working. And last but not least, if you don't want to touch your system manually, change your config, stuff like that, you don't have to. Yeah, there are multiple ways, like ignition, combustion, afterburn, when it comes to first boot configuration, but also Ansible salt for ongoing operations. Um, everything kind of available out of the box, which I personally like. 
I found that um, the whole transactional update thing is most confusing for most of the people, at least the people that I talk to. So I wanted to dive a little deeper into that quickly, what it actually means and how it works. When we just go from left to top, we see we boot a system into a snapshot. Let's just call it snapshot one. That's my system, it works, I use it, it's fine. Now I want to update something. Normally, I would run zipper up. Now, I use transactional update up. What happens? A new snapshot gets deployed, and in that snapshot, zipper up is running and applies all patches. If that operation is successful, and with successful, I mean that really every package was successfully installed, then we can reboot our system, and on the next reboot, it will start snapshot number two. And at that stage, my system is running with the updated packages. If the reboot would fail, it would revert back to snapshot one. So that means even if something goes wrong with my package installation or updates, I will never have a situation that my system is broken, because worst case, I just use the snapshot that worked before. Yeah, some of the challenges. Um, not climbing the Alps is not easy. We heard that already. Um, and yeah, I think um, a lot of that was way more in that cupboard already, but I just want to share a little my personal impressions about it. So yeah, ALP focus on new things. So it's not the old leap or sleek code base anymore. It's something new, which means um, it introduced breaking changes. Yeah, that's, that's just how it is. Um, but I think that's something good, actually. We will see. Um, but that also means that, in my impression, it's very unlikely that we will see an in-place upgrade path from Leap to ALP. Um, an example that comes to my mind why that is a challenge um, is actually just ButterFS as a root file system. Yeah, because um, it's required, it's mandatory, you need ButterFS as a root system when it comes to ALP. And a lot of systems out there are using X4 or XFS for the root systems. So, um, and then you have a lot of other challenges with packages, and containers, and stuff like that. We heard about it. Um, yeah, and that application's running mostly inside containers instead of classic RPM packages. Um, I think that makes total sense um, to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's interesting, the approach that I saw from SUSE is that you um, sometimes still have a small RPM package, but that's more like a wrapper. So um, it just installs something like a shell script or something so that you as user can consume the application in a familiar way. But under the hood, it starts a container in the back and does all the fancy things for you. Um, there are some demo workloads available. So if you're interested, go to OBS and try it out. Um, we heard before, you can do that with the version 01 Bedrock release. So be fast. <laughs> I don't know when the next one will come in. Good. Um, now that we've talked a little about um, ALP in general, let's take a look on building an image on OBS and an image which is, at the end, compatible with AWS and can be started at AWS. First of all, what's an AMI? Um, an AMI, an Amazon machine image, it contains the operating system, and without that, you just can't start an EC2 instance. You always need an AMI, it doesn't work otherwise. Um, besides the operating system, there is at least one or multiple snapshots in such an AMI, but also some additional metadata and configurations. So it's not just a raw image, there's something more in that. Um, there are 
a lot of different AMIs available on AWS for different kinds of workloads. Yeah, sometimes um, you have standard images that come from AWS for Linux systems or Windows systems, but you have also in the marketplace a lot of third parties which are publishing AMIs. An AMI can be customized. Um, if you want to customize something from a standard AMI, it's probably um, the easiest way to use Amazon EC2 Image Builder for that purpose. Or you can also build AMIs from scratch. And that's actually what I did for ALP. That's the classic life cycle of an AMI. Um, to understand the whole from scratch and customization part a little better, I think we should quickly go through that. Um, so we learned that an AMI is based on one or more snapshots. So the first thing I do is I create um, a snapshot or import an existing snapshot. Then I go to the next phase and register that snapshot as AMI. At that stage, from a raw image, we go into an AMI with additional information to be used to launch EC2 instances. I can customize a launch EC2 instance. For example, um, I change something on OS level, I install a package or something. And then I can, if I want, just start over and create a new snapshot out of that instance, register it as AMI, and so on and so forth. So the whole life cycle always comes back to I create something, I register something, and I launch something. I assume that most of you um, are aware about OBS and the OBS package workflow, but to ensure that we're all on the same page, um, just a quick um, refresher sum up about that process. I have my package in OBS. Um, when I commit a change to OBS, OBS will build my package. Let's assume it's successful. Um, and then afterwards, publish my package. When I want to change something, I check out my code. I make a change. I commit my changes. OBS builds, OBS publish. And that's my whole process. And I can iterate as much as I want. The next thing is the actual package, the OBS package, which contains the information to build my image. The project I created and the package that I created um, is based on ALP Bedrock 01. That was the latest available release when, when I started. And it's inspired by the OpenSUSE uh, Leap cloud images. So why inspired? Why based on that? Um, when I started, I first had to figure out, OK, how does SUSE actually build the ALP images? So what's different? What's required? What's the file system architecture, um, post build steps, and so on and so forth? But then um, I needed kind of a reference. So um, what do I need to really make it an image which works on AWS? So that's why inspired on the existing cloud images. Um, I was just checking out which packages are required, which additional packages are required. Is there any specific AWS-specific configuration? During that research, I realized that I need three packages which are not part of the ALP repositories. And these packages are cloud init, Amazon SSM agent, and Flatpak. Um, I know that SUSE is actually using Ignition and Combustion and Afterburn to do the configuration. Um, I, I assume that would also work. I saw something that they're able to retrieve cloud in user data from uh, the metadata service on AWS. But most of the AWS AMIs today use cloud in it. That's why I just went also with cloud in it for my first. Um, first try. The Amazon SSM agent is just an agent that allows us to connect to Amazon System Service, a system manager, uh, and perform various tasks on, on that system. But I explain more about that um, later. 
So then additional packages, and this is exactly where this AWS-specific thing comes into the picture. Um, I need AWS CLI to communicate with other AWS services from OS level. Um, Cloud Net Config and DHCP client to ensure that when a machine boots up, it receives and configures the network interface um, configuration appropriately. Another thing in my package is overlays. An overlay is basically an archive with a folder structure. So you have in your archive slash Etsy slash whatever. So if I want to customize something, and yes, I wanted to, I just create these configuration files, put it in an archive, and during build phase, it will be extracted and customized my image. That makes it just easier for me. Um, the overlay for EC2 root contains things like um, a basic cloud init config, configurations for crony time server, kernel modules which are loaded, and things like that. Then I needed a second overlay for repositories. Um, two things. First, for my branched packages, so the packages which are not part of ALP, which was, for example, cloud init. And the other one was ALP Bedrock Media. Um, now you, you ask, OK, why did I configure that manually? Shouldn't that be included? Um, yes, normally it should during build. Um, but there was an interesting bug. <laughs> um, I just reported it, and it was already fixed. Um, it, depending on the host where you build the image or where you run the image, the variable arc sometimes contains a suffix, like for free, uh, v3, v4. Um, but the URL where you can get the ALP bedrock packages, it's just um, x86.64. So sometimes it worked, sometimes not. Um, so my workaround is basically to hard code that URL for now. And yeah, in future packages, it's fixed. Whew. A lot, huh? <laughs> Good. Um, so, what do we have so far? Um, brief overview about ALP, building on OBS. Um, let's now assume I have my shiny new image on ABS. Mm, so, and now, how do I come from OBS to AWS? Like that. Um, and it looks familiar, right? Because we, we had that a few minutes before. At the top, we have the OBS workflow. And at the bottom, we have the AMI workflow. Um, three steps are new here. It's download, decompress, and upload. Um, OBS compresses images in XZ format, which is nice. It's kind of OBS to do that. Um, makes out of a 10 gig image a 2 gig image. The problem is that if I want to import it um, as snapshot in AWS, I need the raw image. So um, yeah, I just wrote a small Python script um, to do these things for me. So it downloads from OBS, it does the decompression, it uploads to S3, and then it triggers the import, the registration, and then the last step, um, the launching, that was something I just did manually during development. Um, and that was OK. Why not? But when I hit the point where this image actually was starting on AWS and I had a login prompt, I wanted something more automated. Sorry. And started to create an automated workflow for that. Um, I work for AWS. That's my tool set. So um, for sure, I, I use that. But as always in life and with open source, there are millions of ways to achieve that. That's just my way. Um, we start at the bottom with OBS. And I was thinking, OK, how can I um, get notified? You know, when my image is ready, it's published, how can I trigger something? Um, and then I found out that we have a nice AMQP service running from OpenSUSE. And the service um, receives event notifications for everything which happens on OBS. 
a package is built, a package is published, a package build fails, whatsoever. So I was thinking, how can I use that? And then I decided, okay, I create a small Docker image with a Python script, which listens to these events. And as soon as it realized that there's a publish event for my package, I can just do some fancy things here. I needed a service to run this container image, and I decided to go with Fargate. That's um, a serverless service on AWS to run containers. And I use Fargate Spot. Um, Fargate Spot is, I use spare capacity from AWS, and AWS can always reclaim that capacity with a two minute warning and just shut down my container. Um, but I get a way better price compared to on demand. And I just have the listener running here, right? So that's just a, a small script which listens for events. I don't care if it gets restarted <laughs> because it just reconnects and um, starts receiving that events anymore. Good. So OBS, signal to AQMQP, Fargate receives it. Now we trigger a code pipeline on AWS code pipeline. And um, I have three stages in that pipeline. It's source, build, and test. Um, source phase, yeah, I just get my, I download my source codes um, for my scripts to make it available for the further stages. Um, build is then actually what we saw earlier. It's the download, decompress, upload, import, register stuff. That's all done by code build. So code build goes to OBS, downloads the image, decompresses it, saves it in NS3, and then does the importing as AMI. And then, that's why we have EC2 on the right side. I wanted to automate my testing. Um, that's what I explain in more detail in the next slide, just a final thought on that one. Um, building infrastructure on AWS, or overall building infrastructure, um, can get messy at some point if you do it manually, right? You create a lot of services. At some point, you're not 100% sure which service belongs to which application. And that's why I use um, AWS CDK as my infrastructure as code tool. I can program my infrastructure in Python and just deploy it or even tear down the whole thing if I don't need it anymore. So for the testing step, I decided to go with Ansible. Why not? Um, normally, Ansible is a configuration management tool, but I found it useful to use Ansible also for other things. And when you take a look on the right side, we have um, check mode true. That means um, this Ansible task doesn't change anything on this system. But if it would change something to achieve that goal, um, I, I would get notified. So I can see that. This, tasks, uh, this task says, um, is my Amazon SSM agent enabled, and is it running? The return from Ansible will be OK if that's the case, or changed if this is not the case. So the logic, which is in my code pipeline is actually change true means test failed. Because I declared in that playbook how my image, how ALP should look like, which services should be uh, enabled, which files should be there. And if something is not as I expect, not as I configured it, um, the code pipeline will realize it, and I get notified. I found it quite flexible and fast to implement based on Ansible because I don't have to write much code or reinvent the wheel. Ansible can just has modules for all these things, like is a package installed and something. So Ansible deploys an EC2 instance for me. It does a variety of checks, and then it cleans up the environment. And then make, that makes it a whole automated process. OBS build, OBS publish, notifies my pipeline. My pipeline imports an AMI image. 
Ansible does the testing, and that's it. So, now that um, the image is built, the image is in AWS, it's running, does it? I think that's the final question for that session. So, is it running? How does it behave? What are the um, observations? And I can say, um, everything that I personally would expect from such a new image when I created it worked already very well. <laughs> there was um, actually nothing that, that I was really missing at that point. Um, I could use cloud init to customize the system, start a service or something on boot. I can access the um, EC2 metadata service to get information about my instance, like host name, or whatever I want. Um, I can reach the internal NTP service, the internal DNS service. I can use AWS CLI um, to communicate with other AWS services. In my test case, I uploaded an S and file to an S3 bucket from the ALP system that worked without a problem. Um, yeah, and the AWS Systems Manager. So you remember that I installed the Amazon SSM agent, and yeah, run command, fleet manager, session manager. These are all features that are, were working out of the box in my tests. Um, yeah, run command, as the NAM name implies, um, you can execute scripts or commands ad hoc on that system through the AWS console. Um, Fleet Manager gives you some insights about the system. You can watch processes. You can take a look on file system and a lot of other things. And Session Manager um, allows you to, con to create an SSM user ad hoc on the system and then connect to that user in a session so you don't have to go um, through SSH. Um, and that all worked. I didn't have to change anything. Um, yeah, let's uh, compare it to OpenSUSE Leap. And you can also compare it to SLEE, actually. Um, when I came up with that session, I actually wanted to talk about this comparison just when it comes to AWS. But based on the results that we saw earlier, I realized it's more about differences in general, because um, the only thing that, that is kind of AWS related is that AWS SSM, Systems Manager, is not officially supported. But um, it's also not officially supported for OpenSUSE Leap. It's only supported for SLAS, um, even if they're technically very similar at that point. But as we saw, it works. Um, yeah, uh, let's take a look. What else do we have? Yeah, I think most of the other things were already mentioned before, so let's just focus on a few of them. Um, as the Linux is running in enforced mode, personally, I think that's a great plus, so that, that's great. Um, Wicked is replaced by Network Manager. I was a little surprised about that because uh, with the years, I learned to like Wicked, actually, so I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, yeah, and then from a troubleshooting perspective, there is now this toolbox container um, that I have to use. Okay, so I as administrator have to obviously change a little my behavior and how things do, but that's fine. Um, but still, for me personally, the highlights are transactional updates, but also that no vector is, is included in, in ALP. Um, and that's the proof. <laughs> I really was running the vector on AP. Um, my first try was on a machine with two CPUs, two gig of RAM. I would highly recommend to avoid that. Um, the OOM killer tried its best, but <laughs> um, nope, the machine just died. So I would say two CPUs, four gig of RAM, and upwards, yeah? But prototype. From that perspective, it's not, not a problem if it fails. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, it was very easy to install, by the way. 
So you just need two commands. So one command is to run podman with the label install. Then it will create a systemd service file for you. And then afterwards, you just enable systemd, the systemd service. And after a few minutes, you see the web interface. That was really cool. And actually, that's it. Um, feedback is very important for us at, at Amazon. Um, so please take a few seconds and fill out your survey. Um, and yeah, um, now it's time to go to questions and answers. And I thank for your attention. Pictures, but no questions. That's good. I guess if there are no questions, um, then thanks a lot.